I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour. Uh, this is a program entitled Mary Shelley's Frankenstein at 200. It's alive and why it still matters. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here in the School of Medicine. Uh, and this is a program that is one of our History of the Health Sciences lectures. Um, it also is, for a handful of us in the room, uh, right in line with our specialization in literature and medicine. In the summer of 1816, an 18-year-old English girl on a lark in Switzerland with a married man and her stepsister began writing a story that would outlive her by centuries. Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, published in 1818, still fascinates and confounds us today, told and retold in so many genres that even those who've never read the original know the story. So this Medical Center Hour marks Frankenstein's 200th anniversary. Celebrating a bicentennial isn't just a look back. Such a landmark observance says just as much or even more about the here and now, who we are as individuals, professionals, and a society, what matters to us as a culture, what our hopes and dreams, likelihoods and limits, ambitions and anxieties are all about. Parenthetically, I'll mention that we are currently observing UVA's bicentennial, the university's cornerstone having been laid in October 1817, just months before Frankenstein went to press. So this history of the Health Sciences Medical Center Hour harks back to the 19th century but also scans our 21st century horizons by exploring two of the many reasons for Mary Shelley's novel's apparent immortality. First, Frankenstein probes the central quest of medicine and biology. What is life? Second, it asks, but importantly, it leaves for us to answer this essential ethical question. Should we, as human beings, manipulate the spark of life? For this inquiry, we welcome today independent scholar Susan Tyler Hitchcock on my immediate right. She has long studied the Frankenstein story and its rich and complex legacy, from its implications for cutting-edge science and medicine to its powerful iconography in the public imagination and popular culture. Ms. Hitchcock wrote a cultural history of Frankenstein, and she also created an exhibit here at UVA on the same topic. So who better to engage for this novel's bicentennial? We also welcome, on my far right, Jacqueline Guo, a first-year medical student here at UVA. For years, Frankenstein has been one of her favorite novels. But now that she's studying medicine, how might this tale read differently? Has it acquired new meanings? We hope this program helps to spark interest in this story for the ages, and definitely for our age. We look forward to your questions and comments at the close of this hour. And if you're spurred to reread Mary Shelley's prescient tale, or inspired to read it for the first time, please see the UVA bookstore's table just outside the auditorium. Frankenstein is there. So we'll get us we'll get started with Susan Tyler Hitchcock um, and Frankenstein at 200. Thank you. I really uh, thank you all for coming to share a few minutes of your time with me. I realize there are uh, layers of meaning to this occasion. I've been invited to share with you in the celebration of the 200th anniversary of one of the modern world's most influential novels, Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus, begun in 1816 and published in early 1818. But I realize today has other meanings as well. It's Valentine's Day. Not necessarily a day we take off work, but certainly a holiday we all enjoy recognizing and if you're lucky, recognizing with a sweetheart. And as it happens, it's also Ash Wednesday a holy day in the Christian calendar that not everyone observes personally, but this still permeates our culture, given the occasional person you will see on the street or in the hallway who wears the cross of ashes on his or her forehead. 
So here we are, recognizing the anniversary of Frankenstein on a day that happens to symbolize the confluence of love and the admissions, um, admission of one's sins. An ironic coincidence. But let's talk about Frankenstein, a novel, a story, a myth that has not only lasted but grown in its reputation as a classic of literature, called by many the world's first science fiction novel, one of the most often assigned novels in the English language. This was not true when I attended high school and college, but I hear it's hard to avoid reading Frankenstein at least once in a good American education these days. I'm curious to know, and you can be honest, how many of you have actually read the novel? How many of you know the story? Everyone. And that's one of the points I want to make. That's one of the most amazing things about this novel and its aftermath, and the reason that we can call it not just a literary work, but a myth and a phenomenon. Over these two centuries, the tale has evolved far beyond its origins as a work of fiction written by a teenage girl on a lark with friends in Geneva and published anonymously. Since then, the story of Frankenstein has been told and retold, interpreted over and over in hundreds of versions up to the present day, as you might have been noticing in the last few weeks. Like the creature at the heart of the story, the myth of Frankenstein is alive. It's alive. It's still alive. And as the, as the creature tells his maker, the evolution of Frankenstein is a long and strange tale. The novel was published right around the first of the year, 1818, by Lackington and Allen, a less than respectable London publisher whose motto was cheapest bookseller in the world, and whose other titles at the time included a complete system of occult philosophy and apparitions or the mystery of ghosts, hobgoblins, and haunted houses. Percy Bysshe Shelley, at that point Mary's lover but not husband, had tried to interest more elevated publishers in the manuscript, but they had declined. Many reviewed it, only a few applauded it. One reviewer of the time called it an uncouth story leading to no conclusion, either moral or philosophical. Another described it as a tissue of horrible and disgusting absurdity. Interestingly enough, the reviewer who gave it the highest praise was the poet and novelist Sir Walter Scott, perhaps the most famous and beloved British author of the day, to whom Percy Bysshe Shelley had sent a review copy. Scott called it a, an extraordinary tale that showed its author to have uncommon powers of poetic imagination. In fact, Scott wrongly guessed that its author was Percy Bysshe Shelley, who was already notorious as a poet who dabbled in atheism. Not all contemporary authors praised it so highly, though. Another novelist, though, William Beckford, scribbled into his copy of the novel that he considered it perhaps the foulest toadstool that has yet sprung up from the reeking dunghill of the present times. Next, I gotta go next. There we go. Um, the novel Frankenstein quickly went out of print, but the story lived on. In 1823, the first of many stage renditions of the Frankenstein story was performed in London. Presumption, or the fate of Frankenstein, was a melodrama that roughly paralleled the plot of Shelley's novel, and indeed introduced some elements that have been perpetuated in the retelling ever since. Most notably, the half-wit apprentice to Dr. Frankenstein, a character we see repeated in the 1931 film played by Dwight Fry. And if you remember, he's the one who gets the abnormal brain and causes all the problems. And later, in the lovable character of Igor, played by the Google-eyed Marty Feldman in Young Frankenstein. It's also in presumption that we first hear Victor Frankenstein speak the words, it lives, it lives, to which Fritz, his assistant, replies, there's a hob, hob, goblin, seven and 20 feet high. P. 
Peak stage directions indicated that the creature should sport dark black flowing hair, skin light blue or gray, and a similarly colored cloth draped around fitting quite close as if it were his flesh. This is an image actually, uh, an engraving of that um, actor portraying the creature in presumption. <laughs> The drama was supposed to end, according to the script, with something resembling an avalanche caused when Frankenstein confronts his cre cre creation on a snowy mountain and shoots at him with a gun, causing the death of both creator and creature. It was not an easy scene for stage managers to recreate. One production in Birmingham, England, scrounged around in their existing prop collection to find a way to evoke an avalanche and ended up with stage hands throwing a white canvas elephant down onto the stage from the rigging above. <laughs> you would think that a writer would object to such a slapstick rendition of her literary work, but it seems that Mary Shelley took it all in stride. While her story of Frankenstein was grabbing the attention of all London, she had been living in Italy, hearing only from afar how the world was responding to her work. Her life took tragic turns, she gave birth five times, but only one of those children survived. Her stepsister committed suicide. Her husband drowned. By 1823, she had returned a widow to London, her childhood home, with Percy Florence Shelley, her only child, then age four, the only child of Mary and Percy Bysshe Shelley to grow to adulthood. Not long after her arrival back in, in London, she attended a performance of Presumption. Lo and behold, she wrote a friend the next day, I found myself famous. I was much amused. Her story had taken on a life of its own, and it has kept on doing that ever since. <coughs> All this is very amusing, but what does it mean to you? The point worth making here is how the story of Frankenstein was so malleable how open to reinterpretation and also so recognizable and applicable to the lives of so many. Presumption played in New York in 1825. A French version played in France in 1826. By that time, retellings were appearing in print as well, and references to the monster made by man were surfacing in the public sphere, even in Parliament, where one MP used a reference to the creature from the splendid fiction of a recent romance to express his worries about the end of slavery. Everyone knew the story he was talking about, and to refer to that story captured an entire cluster of shared meaning. All that is still true today. Mary Shelley could herself could not uh, refrain from re reinterpreting her own story. The first edition went out of print very quickly, her father arranged a second edition while she was in Italy, but it fell flat, and very few copies of that even exist in rare book libraries today. But the story would not die. And by 1831, another London publisher, whose stock and trade was keeping what he called standard novels in print, decided that Frankenstein needed a place on his lineup. Uh, here's the, this is the title page of the 1831 edition of Frankenstein. And they chose um, the scene of, of Victor Frankenstein sadly leaving his home and taking off for his uh, time as a medical student. The 1831 edition of the novel stayed in print for more than 20 years. It's hard to confirm, but my investigation suggests that the novel has never gone out of print since. There have always been editions of Frankenstein on the market, and today on Amazon you could choose from among hundreds. I tried to count, but I gave up at about 200. <laughs> and it was only going back about to uh, 2015. For the new edition, Mary Shelley did a thorough revision of her work and wrote a new introduction. It's there we hear for the first time the details that have now gone down in history about how this story came to light as she answers the question, in her words, so very frequently asked me how I, then a young girl, came to think of and to dilate upon so very hideous an idea. 
She tells of how, accompanied by the man then her lover, but whom she properly calls her husband in this introduction, and others summered with um, Lord Byron in Geneva, how they wrote, read ghost stories together to each other through stormy weather, and how Byron put to them a challenge. We will each write a ghost story, he said to his guests. I busied myself to think of a story, Mary Shelley wrote in 1831, 15 years after that summer in Geneva and 13 years after no the novel was first published. I felt that blank incapability of invention, which is the greatest misery of authorship, when dull nothing replies to our anxious invocations. Have you thought of a story? I was asked each morning. And each morning, I was forced to reply with a mortifying negative. Finally, Mary Shelley tells us, the story of the man who makes a monster appeared to her as if a dream, in a dream. She speaks of herself not as the active creator of this amazing story, but as an empty vessel that received it. As Jill Lepore points out in her recent article in The New Yorker, just in the last few weeks, a really interesting article I, I commend, um, as, as she writes, she virtually erased herself as an author. Here is Mary Shelley's description of, of how the story came to her mind. My imagination, unbidden, possessed and guided me, gifting the successive images that arose in my mind with a vividness far beyond the usual balance of reverie. I saw with shut eyes but acute mental vision far beyond the usual bounds of reverie. Uh, uh, sorry, I saw with shut eyes but acute mental vision. I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then on the working of some powerful engine show signs of life and stir with an uneasy half vital motion. Here is actually the 1831 illustration of the creature and Frankenstein horrified at what he has done, running away. In, the, in her introduction to the 1831 edition, as in the significantly edited version of the novel that Mary Shelley turned over to her new publisher, a new layer of moral judgment has been laid by the author on top of the story that she tells. She goes on in the introduction commenting directly and even piously on the ethics of her character's actions in a way she never did in her original manuscript. Frightful must it be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. He would hope that left to itself the slight spark of life which he had communicated would fade that this thing which had received such imperfect animation would subside into dead matter. I wonder if we're actually hearing Mary Shelley's own regret that her monster, her hideous progeny as she calls it here, continued to live and threaten her with the moral judgment of her times. She continues to describe this creation scene, empathizing with her, her character as he hopes that the spark of life he infused into his creature might, come, might go out, but of course it doesn't. He might hope, she writes, that he might sleep in the belief that the silence of the grave would quench forever the transient existence of the, horrid, of the hideous corpse. He sleeps, but he is awakened. He opens his eyes. Behold, the horrid thing stands at his bedside, opening his curtains and looking on him with yellow, watery, but speculative eyes. It's not only in this new introduction that Mary Shelley added a veneer of propriety to her horrifying novel as she prepared its second edition. Just remember, she was now a widow in her mid-30s, a single working mother of an 11-year-old son, relying on her writing and a tiny allowance granted begrudgingly by her bitter and judgmental father-in-law. She had witnessed the death of her husband, friends, family, and children. She was a different woman from the 18-year-old girl whose crazed imagination had come up with this story. She had all the reason in the world to portray herself as a respectable and conservative author and her now famous creation as a moral tale. 
She made adjustments to the novel. No longer does Victor Frankenstein marry his cousin. Mary Shelley wanted to distance herself from any intimations of incest. So she turns Elizabeth into a poor waif charitably adopted by Victor's parents. As Victor tells his story, he, he more often invokes God and tradition and admits his own moral depravity early and more directly, spinning his story from the very beginning as the work of destiny's immutable laws that decreed my utter and terrible destruction. The 1818 edition of Frankenstein leaves in the balance the question of right and wrong, applauding the audacity of Victor Frankenstein's brilliant science, while at the same time recoiling at its murderous consequences. The 1831 edition of Frankenstein infuses the story with judgmental certainty, pushing what was an ambiguous myth into a moral lesson, and to my mind at least losing some of the evanescence and the very human complexity at the heart of the story. But neither Mary Shelley nor anyone else, including the Edison film rendition, of 1910, James Whale and Boris Karloff in the Universal Films of the 1930s, Christopher Lee in the Hammer Films of the 1950s, and all the other many, many retellings that have emerged over these 200 years, no one can entirely destroy the central chilling paradox of this story, which is that as the human in intellect and imagination dream up new realities, and as human science and technology strive to bring those realities to life, we face the risk of uncertainty and the danger of unintended consequences. There are always, in the retelling of the story of Frankenstein, two sides to the story. And it's this glimmer of uncertainty at its heart that makes the myth still matter today. Mary Shelley could never have known how truly pertinent her vision would become to the 21st century as science progresses closer and closer, deeper and deeper into the replication of life. The act of creating life or bringing an inanimate object to life is, of course, at the very heart of the story of Frankenstein. Ancient myths and traditional legends abound with such an act. Think of Pygma Pygmalion, whose kiss brought a beloved statue to life. Think of the golem, the figure of clay brought to life by a rabbi in Jewish tradition. Think even of the myth of Prometheus, which tells that the primeval demigod made humans of clay, an especially pertinent predecessor since Mary Shelley directly links her novel to that myth with its subtitle, The Modern Prometheus. But over and over, those myths tell us that creating life is a power reserved for the gods alone. That is certainly the message of Prometheus, who was punished for championing his human creations by being bound eternally to a high rock, victim to daily visits by vultures who plucked out his liver. But for Mary Godwin and her circle of friends, the possibility of creating life was not just a myth. The possibility hovered near actuality. Science seemed on the brink of identifying and controlling the essential spark of life, and these ideas fascinated her. The intellectual climate of the times, the era of revolution, democracy, and freedom from religious dogma allowed it. Erasmus Darwin, poet, naturalist, and grandfather to Charles Darwin, watched what he called animalcules come to life in wheat paste under a glass jar. Joseph Priestley, discoverer of oxygen, experimented by growing mold on vegetables to see how life began. His science was considered so radical, so antithetical to the God-given nature of things that his home was attacked and burned by an anti-revolutionary mob. At the same time, uh, scientists including Benjamin Franklin were exploring electricity and linking it to the force of life in human and animal bodies. Most famous among those is Luigi Galvani, known for his experiments passing electrical current through the bodies of frogs. His nephew, Luigi Aldini, created a traveling exhibit passing electrical currents through the severed heads of oxen to make their eyes roll and their tongues wag. 
And he took things even further, as shown in this picture. He showed that the same process could occur in a human body. He used a massive battery of copper and zinc, and from it strung wires to the head and anus of the corpse of an executed murderer. The charge shot through and made the body move. According to one observer of this, uh, of this traveling show, the jaw began to quiver. One eye was actually opened. The right hand was raised and clenched, and the legs and thighs were set in motion. As this observer puts it, it appeared to the uninformed part of the bystanders as if the wretched man was on the eve of being restored to life. Does this sound familiar? This, of course, is the, 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 the great scene from the 1931 James Whale, Boris Karloff Universal film, um, which has really impressed upon the story of Frankenstein certain details, the, the look of the monster, the madness of the scientist, and the fact that lightning was the, the key to life. But all these things, actually, all of this, these ideas about uh, creating life and electricity being the spark of life were circling around in the imagination of, of the author of Frankenstein. In fact, though, the, her novel does not really describe how the medical student Victor Frankenstein infuses life into his cadaverous creature. Layer upon layer of interpretation has filled our own imaginations with how it happened. Um, uh, scientists need to figure out how it happened, and filmmakers need to figure out how it happened. So here we have the crackle and buzz of huge Van de Graaff generators and Tesla coils, creaking chains lifting the body up into the heavens, the definitive bolt of lightning. But none of that happens in the novel. To, to examine the causes of life, let me, let me share with you how close we get to learning how he did it. To examine the causes of life, we must first have recourse to death, states Frankenstein, explaining his method of inquiry. Spending days and nights in vaults and charnel houses, he meditates on the nature of death, examining and analyzing all the minutiae of causation as exemplified in the change from life to death and death to life. Just as the story of Frankenstein appeared to Mary Shelley fully formed in a dream, or so she says, in the same way, the secret understanding of how to create life presented itself to Victor Frankenstein in her novel. He meditated upon death and life, and then until, uh, until from the midst of this darkness, a sudden light broke in upon me, a light so brilliant and wondrous, yet so simple, that while I became dizzy with the immensity of the prospect which it illustrated, I was surprised that among so many men of genius who had directed their inquiries toward the same science, that I alone should be reserved to discover so astonishing a secret. Finally, he says, after days and nights of incredible labor and fatigue, I succeeded in discovering the cause of generation and life. Nay, more, I became myself capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. Does this explain how he does it? No, not here. And not when he describes the moment of success with his cre creation, either. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning, the rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. We're never told how Victor Frankenstein did it, and that dark secret at the center of this novel is one of the most forceful mysteries that pulls us in, and at the same time that's allowed generation after generation to spin centrifugally out from the 
core story, making it into a story about galvanism, steam engines, abnormal brains, organ transplants, artificial intelligence, robots, gene editing, um, GMO foods, cloning, as in this 2001 cartoon. <laughs> in fact, I, I'll imag I imagine that many of you can think about the corollary in your work today. So why does all this matter? Does it make any sense to look back to a 200-year-old novel written by an 18-year-old English girl for guidance in our times? I'd like to leave you with two answers to that question and with an invitation to further contemplation. Frankenstein matters to us today for many reasons, but let me highlight two that I find most compelling for those of you in the medical sciences today. First, it speaks to the heart of all investigations in the life sciences, inviting the question, what consequences and responsibilities attend any investigation into the essence of life? Second, it does not give us an answer. Try as she might, Mary Shelley could not overlay a final moral judgment on her original amoral or at least ambiguous story. And no matter how the story gets told, when we return to it, there was always room for discussion. And that's why the novel Frankenstein still matters today. And why this character still roams our sidewalks on Halloween, still appears in one manifestation after another in film and television, still sits on so many reading lists for high school and college English courses, and still appears in the media as a catchphrase for the ethical dilemmas that accompany every radical pursuit and every daring advance in the life sciences. Frankenstein is not an answer, it's a question. To read the novel, to see any interpretation of it, even just to think of the myth and its meaning, is to ask those questions again. And so I invite you, as we celebrate Valentine's Day and this 200th anniversary of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, to spend a little time with this monster, this creation that has outlived its maker because of its universal and malleable meaning, and see what questions and answers it brings forth in your imagination. Thank you. In light of the bicentennial of one of my favorite novels, I decided to reread Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to see how my time in medical school has influenced my perspective on the story. As a medical student, I come away from the book with a new understanding of the importance of humanity and responsibility in science and medicine. To me, what makes Frankenstein so enduring is the fact that it speaks about our innate desire for knowledge and asks us to consider our motivations for this knowledge and the risk that it can pose within society if it is achieved. Victor Frankenstein's motivation for his creation were hinged on his hubris and desire for acknowledgement in society. Upon the discovery of his ability to, ability to reanimate matter, he dreamed that a species would bless him as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to him. This already doomed his creature to become evil because Dr. Frankenstein's intentions were not good to begin with. He sought for his own glory and not necessarily for the betterment of mankind. To me, this means that the intention behind the scientific endeavor, or any endeavor for that matter, is everything because it dictates the fate of that creation. In the production of animating his creature, Frankenstein ignored all of his other passions and his health. He says, my cheek had grown pale with study, and my person had become emaciated with confinement. I seem to have lost all soul or sensation but for this one pursuit. To be so engrossed in one pursuit, one can forget the bigger picture. For me as a first year medical student, I spend so much time behind a computer that I sometimes forget that being a doctor is all about relating to people and to improving their lives. As Frankenstein looks back on his mistakes, he poignantly remarks, a human being in perfection ought always to preserve a calm and peaceful mind, and never to allow a passion or a transitory desire to disturb his tranquility. 
I do not think that the pursuit of knowledge is an exception to this rule. If the study to which you apply yourself has a tendency to weaken your infections and to destroy your taste for those simple pleasures in which no alloy can possibly mix, then that study is certainly unlawful, that is to say, not befitting the human mind. I agree that to study so narrowly is not befitting of the human mind. We must never lose sight of the humanity within ourselves or within our subject of study. Regarding the ethical implications of Frankenstein's creature, the question is often posed about whether or not we are playing God in our scientific and technological advancements. But after reading this novel again, I propose that from Shelley's view, point of view, the problem is not necessarily or only that Frankenstein played God and created life. It's the, it's the fact that he refused to take responsibility for his creation afterwards. Frankenstein's creature was, as the creature puts it himself, benevolent and good. Misery made him a fiend. Frankenstein failed to embed a sense of tranquility, education, and love into his creation, and subsequently the creation became wretched. I think scientific curiosity is an important and natural human desire, but it cannot exist unchecked. We must always be sure to nurture and take responsibility for what we discover and create. Frankenstein will always remain one of my favorite books because every time I pick it up, I find something new. Its themes on human nature and the pursuit of knowledge are so universal that it can be applied to almost any realm, be it the political, ethical, scientific, romantic, etc. In my practice as a physician, the novel will serve to remind me to always remain passionate in my search for knowledge, but to never forget my motivations or my responsibility in these pursuits. This is something that may seem obvious, but is easy to forget when one becomes engrossed in their practice. This is why I'll never forget to keep my tranquility of mind in medical school and beyond. Thank you both. We have some time for questions. John's going to get us a couple of microphones uh, to bring to those of you in the audience who have um, some questions or comments. Okay. And um, so we have a generous amount of time for discussion, and we'd very much like to know, you know, your familiarity with the novel, with the ideas that have been discussed today, um, and, and why, you know, sort of what brought you here today and what kinds of thoughts you have about Frankenstein and 200. So when, you, uh, when we bring the mic to you, please uh, identify yourself and then uh, make your comment or ask your question. And you may direct your comment or question to either or both of our speakers. I'm Carrie Douglas, and I'm in the anthropology department, history of anthropology. But actually, I'm here because um, just a few months ago, um, I joined a reading club in my neighborhood. And I'd never done that. But looking forward to real life soon, which means retirement, I decided to join a reading club and read outside of my field. And so one of the second novel that they picked was Frankenstein. I thought, what? OK. So, um, but it was very enlightening. So I'm just coming from having read it. and. Um, and talking about it in an eclectic group of people, and bringing, of course, my anthropology to it. I had so I had my question. So that's kind of my my context. That's what I'm saying. Um, but I had a question to the first speaker, and that was I was kind of shocked because I guess I was so impressed with the uh, car. Uh, what's who's the famous actor that, that gave us the image? Oh, Boris Boris, Boris, Boris Karloff okay. gave us the image. Gave me the image that when I was reading it, I was a little bit surprised, but I was specifically um, surprised to see those early renditions of the creature um, that didn't seem grotesque or ugly at all. I mean, I guess, you know, they just, they didn't do anything to his face, or, or especially the first play that, that Shelley did well, go back and see. Yeah, the, uh, the one thing that we know they did was to paint the skin uh, kind of gray or, or blue. Okay. Um, but I agree, there's not that um, other than human look mm -hmm. to those mm -hmm. creatures. Um, and the toga doesn't, 
<laughs> certainly kind of elevates the, the guy, doesn't it? Um, so maybe painting the skin was what made it grotesque because it looked dead or not alive right. as well, we know yeah. it. Or I think that was the idea that, um, mm -hmm. and, but if you, actually if you read the novel, mm -hmm. um, there, there are ways, I mean he really wanted his uh, creature, his creation to be beautiful and in fact the parts that he brought together to put them together he felt were beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow that moment of the thing coming to life is the moment when he realized, oh my god, this is not beautiful anymore. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's, there is a little bit of a reason to make the monster less monstrous than Boris Karloff has. In other words, make a metaphor for his moral terror. To, Pardon? Say it again? To, to kind of make a metaphor in the phys physical body to Frankenstein, the author's moral disgust, or something like that, to make it uh, because well, there is certainly the um, the suggestion, and I I, I think both of us um, s touched on it a little bit. I mean, there is a way in which the monster is made evil, not born evil, mm -hmm. and I think that was a really important. Um, uh, element of the novel, even as Mary Shelley um, revised it, it was a it was a new idea. The idea that society creates evil, that evil doesn't come from a you know from within, but in fact society can create a criminal. Um, it was an idea that was really important to her father, William Godwin, and his um, political philosophy. And uh, so, if it, so, that is an important thread of the story that he be begins with the potential to be good, and first of all is abandoned by his father, and second of all is so horrifying in his look, mainly because he's bigger than human, okay. which that's what they thought says was, was for the convenience of working on him, um, <laughs> that uh, he evokes um, uh, fear, anger, violence in those around him, and that that perpetuates into his own anger and violence. I, I want to take advantage of just having this just one second more and say, you know, it's interesting because neither of you talked about um, AI, artificial intelligence, and the creatures or the humanoid-like bodies that they're creating to do this. I saw um, when we did our talk, I was referring, when we had our talk as a neighborhood, I was referring to something one of my students had showed me, which was Sophia, who's become the first citizen AI of Saudi Arabia. But when you see her, she's beautiful. Yeah. And I, it's interesting because I, we talked about, well, you see, this time they've made her, it's also a her, exquisitely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's just as creepy. It is just it is as creepy. creepy. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your remarks. It was quite illuminating. Um, my name is Phyllis Kotcheras. I'm a clinical psychologist. And I heard on NPR yesterday, maybe some other people did, an interview, and they emphasized Mary Shelley's mother and her feminist background, and how even at the, that time, the book had a, a feminist following, and they were suggesting that that was, well, I didn't quite get exactly why it had so much popularity that way, but I think they were saying, you're trying to say that a man can create life and take that, you know, uh, uniqueness of the feminine away. And I just wanted to hear you all comment some more on that. I thought that was quite interesting. Um, at the risk of looking um, ancient, <laughs> I'm really interested in a lot of these feminist readings of Frankenstein because, yes, indeed, there is. Um, birth, there is a birth in this book without a woman. And um, not only Jill Lepore, I think that was who was speaking in that, and it was on point, and you can listen to it, um, you can stream it, and it's a really interesting conversation that was yesterday's on point. But also the, um, the biographer Charlotte Gordon, um, and there's an article by Charlotte Gordon in the references that I gave you, but she also wrote a a lengthy biography of both Mary Shelley and her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, called Romantic Outlaws. That's really interesting. 
they do emphasize um, a sort of feminist way of reading um, the novel, but I'm not convinced that that actually happened in Mary Shelley's lifetime. Um, and if it were in the novel, it is a deep stream in Mary Shelley's um, unconscious almost. Um, her mother um, married because she became pregnant um, and died 11 days after giving birth to Mary Wollstonecraft. So the idea of birth and death being one and the same was there from the beginning of Mary, Shel Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley's life. And then she continued to give birth and babies died. So to, that is more prominent in my sense of her than this, um, to my mind, more 21st century um, line of thought that it's a feminist novel. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to both of you. I'm Danny Becker. I'm a doctor and I'm with the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. Um, returning to the creepiness, um, you know, we, we, people like to be creeped out. I mean, that's, I mean, at least in our culture and in, um, in robotic design and in AI and development of virtual humans for teaching and for gaming, there's a concept called the uncanny valley. Have you heard of that? Uh -huh. That if your creation is too human, the people watching are creeped out. They, and, and, and therefore, all of the feature length animations uh, we see, um, they speak and act like they're humans, but they don't quite look human, and, and that's on purpose, yeah. the, the uncanny valley. I can just yell, too. Oh, no, 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 no. Right. go on the recording. Great, thanks. Hi, I'm uh, John Tian from the School of Nursing, and I had a question about how both of you first experienced the novel as a reader. Uh, last year, my son, who was 13, read it for the first time, and one day while he was reading it, he looked up at me and said, Dad, this is the coolest thing I've ever read. <laughs> and I think what he was responding to was, it's an adventure story, it's a sci-fi story, it's a romance, it's got sort of everything. But think back, uh, the second speaker mentioned it was her favorite, one of her favorite books. What was it that first time you read the novel? Uh, what was it that spoke to you both as readers uh, of Shelley's novel? Um, I guess when I read it as an undergrad, the thing that I gravitated to most actually was about human connection and kind of how essential that was to life and kind of the fact that that was devoid from the creatures being kind of made him evil, and it's funny that I gravitated more towards that than towards the scientific initially. Well, actually, honestly, I didn't come to the novel until as a graduate student I was studying English Romantic Literature, and it's one of the things that I found interesting as I was researching my book is that how the reputation of the novel um, in, say, the 50s and 60s, people didn't know about it or didn't really pay much attention to it. And then in the 70s, with the rise of feminist criticism, it became the book, um, one of, you know, one of the, I mean, certainly with Jane Austen, the romantic novel to read. Um, so I was interested in the mirroring between the Make the maker and the monster, the creature and the creator, and um, the the kind of the psychological um, investigation of that relationship. That's what really captured me in my first reading of it. But I'm interested that a 13 year old thinks it's really cool because it's a hard <laughs> book to read. There, it's very uh, antiquated language in a lot of ways. But it's really wonderful um, if you know a young reader is finding. Finding it. Cool. Okay, so my name is John Casella. I'm a first year medical student, and I kind of want to revisit the idea of this uncanny valley because I read the uh, novel for the first time in high school. And when I was a kid growing up, I watched a whole bunch of like cartoons, and that's where I learned the story of Frankenstein. For the longest time, I was so confused when I started reading the book, I thought the monster's name was Frankenstein. And I feel like a lot of people, especially who grew up in the early 2000s, feel the same way. 
But you know that that mistake was made within years, I mean like two years, in the public eye of um, the, the novel. And you know why it happens? Because the, the monster, the creature, has no name. She doesn't give, he, the, the creator doesn't give him a name. Mary Shelley doesn't give him a name. If you look at the credits for the, the 1931 film, The Boris Karloff, it's blank line played by <laughs> Boris Karloff. Um, and it's a symbol of um, a lack of identity or a lack of belonging, a lack of a family, a lack of, lack of a circle of you know, loving um, caregivers. But go ahead. I mean, like, that's really the idea I wanted to get to, because we mentioned this idea of the Uncanny Valley, and I don't know if you've seen um, Star Wars Rogue One, but at, at the very end of the movie, you see a character who is reprised digitally. It's an animated version of Grand Moff Tarkin. The actor who played him, uh, Peter Cushing, he's been dead for about 10 years, but this is an entirely digital reanimation of him and his voice. Um, at the end of this, at the end of this movie, and a lot of people didn't catch that. I know I caught it because I'm a huge Star Wars fan. But like, if you've seen the movie, it's it's pretty good, uh -huh. and it's only getting better. Uh -huh. And then on the flip side of that, what I was mentioning, like I grew up watching cartoons where the monsters may have to be like really goofy with like the nuts and bolts in the side of his head. Right. I just wanted to ask your perspective on like how the creature is portrayed and if that. Is, is should be changed in how we kind of portray the story of Frankenstein. Well, I don't know if I want to get into should be. Um, I think it's, I mean, my book really, in a sense, um, traced the monster and the interpretation of the monster over time. And one of the things that really interested me was, for example, in the Late 60s and early 70s, when, when the counterculture really was um, a part of our landscape and um, underdogs were being seen as heroes, all of a sudden we have characters like Herman Munster and the cartoons that you're talking about. And Frankenstein, which we, by that we can call him <laughs> that, the creature, the monster, becomes this lovable guy. And I, I think there is there was a sort of a cultural um, uh, zeitgeist in a way that the, the the underdog the the poor fellow who never got love de deserves our love. Um, so I think you know I, I don't know that I'm answering your question, but I think it's a really interesting um, passage of the, the many ways. I mean. At the same time, there were Marvel comics that were showing the monster to be absolutely bad, evil, um, you know, really, really a monster. So it's not as if it's always one or the other in the, in the period of culture, but um, which just goes to my point that we can take this story in any direction. Um, it's so rich with meaning. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Susan and Jacqueline. That was really wonderful. Um, and uh, I, I, I've sensed with everybody else's comments, we've kind of been skirting around an issue that you both brought up a little bit, but I just thought I would highlight it, um, Susan, when you were talking about uh, two, two reasons why Frankenstein kind of has an enduring ethical message for us, and, and we're focusing on, on how that... Uh, it prompts us to consider what the ethical implications of certain scientific inquiries are. And Jacqueline, you mentioned that too. Um, and I, I was thinking that there really is a third, I'd highlight the flip side of that, which is not the ethical implications of the lessons of how to recreate life, how is it done, uh, how does Frankenstein do it, should he do it, because of course we don't need to know how he did it, it's not real. But the question of the living thing that he does create, and Jacqueline, you mentioned the humanity involved, uh, it seems to me that one of the lessons that has gone unstated in both of your claims is actually that what this book does is it prompts us to activate our sympathies for the estranged, for the deformed, for the practice of accepting things that we're not sure if they're alive or where they come from or what they are 
uh, but to extend sympathy and compassion for them just the same. And I'm, I'm wondering, especially for you, Jacqueline, as a medical student, if that becomes a really important lesson in medicine, not just to expand your intellectual curiosity, but also your ability to connect on to, to people or things who are not like you, right, at all. I guess. <laughs> What I mentioned earlier about the first time that I read it, that was the part that I connected to most. Like the fact that sympathy and love and all that is so essential to being human. And definitely that is something that I, I guess I didn't highlight it clearly enough, but that always reminds me when I read this book that science cannot be divorced from the humanity within it. I think, you know, as much as I made the point that there isn't a moral, I do think that we come away from the novel and from many, many of the interpretations of the novel with um, the sense that it is our responsibility to care for the, and be aware of, and care for the consequences of our work, um, which Victor Frankenstein didn't do. And um, that has made all the difference. What a wonderful note to end on. Thank you both, Susan and Jacqueline, uh, for your comments and the audience members for your comments and questions as well. Um, I invite you to come next week. We'll be back in this room, newly redone, uh, next week on uh, February 21st for a program called Early Warnings, Tuberculosis, Drug Resistance, and HIV AIDS with uh, UVA's own uh, Christian McMillan from the History Department and Mary Gibson from the School of Nursing. Uh, we hope you can join us then. And in the meantime, um, please uh, thank uh, Jacqueline Guo and Susan Tyler Hitchcock, and have a happy Valentine's Day. Thank you.